So, uh, good evening to everyone. My name is Sava Vojnovic. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Marek Jakubiec from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow as our third lecturer in this year, in 2023. Um, his topic today is Cognitive Legal Studies, Methods, Opportunities, Limitations. Uh, which is in fact a part of a series of lectures on the naturalization of law and jurisprudence, um, which are yet to take place, but have already begun with, um, I guess, Isabella Scotson, and uh, she had talked about experimental jurisprudence. Um, you all know the rules. Uh, Marek will first have 30 minutes for his presentation after which we'll have 30 minutes for the Q&A part of the meeting. Um, and thank you, Mark, for being with us today. It's a pleasure to welcome you. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sava. First of all, it's my pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I know your group quite well, but I think we have never had the opportunity uh, to meet. So it's good to have this occasion today. And uh, let me start with my presentation. I have prepared some slides. So now you should see my slides. Please let me know if everything is okay because now I cannot see you. So yeah, it's fine. we can okay. see it. Great. So my topic for today is cognitive legal studies, methods, opportunities, limitations. And this presentation is aimed at introducing this idea of cognitive legal studies. You are, of course, familiar with this new current. I know that this name is not very popular. So my aim is also to popularize this, this, uh, the name of this current of the, or this research paradigm. Uh, but of course, it's not my invention, but uh, I think it, sh it uh, should or it will gain popularity in the next years. So, um, what's, what is the structure of my talk? Uh, first, uh, introduction, and I will try to briefly explain why, in my opinion, cognitive science is relevant for legal philosophy, and uh, I will briefly uh describe some methodological remarks that are in my opinion important when we want to discuss uh, the relevance of cognitive science for philosophy and especially for legal philosophy and for law in general uh, in the second part i would try to briefly explain why cognitive legal studies why uh, we should or we shouldn't because that's of course the question uh, use uh, this phrase in the third part, uh, I will present very briefly a case study uh, and I will talk about conceptual processing and legal reasoning in light of cognitive sciences, in particular in light of um, one of the most important research paradigms in, uh, in cognitive sciences, namely uh, embodied cognition. And this will lead me to explaining some limitations because uh, what is important uh, when we discuss the relevance of cognitive science for legal philosophy, for legal theory, um, what is important is uh, discussing also the limitations, because I think that this is something that sometimes we forget about. And we should also keep in mind that there are important limitations, which, however, do not undermine this naturalistic endeavor. And in the last part, I will present some conclusions. So let's start. Why is cognitive science relevant? Um, this, I, I don't think that this, uh, this is obvious, that uh, the, the answer yes is obvious, because first of all, what is cognitive science? Cognitive science, painting with a broad bash, of course, is an interdisciplinary research program devoted to the study of broadly understood cognition. I know this definition is very, very imperfect. It, it, and I know even if this is not even a definition, a strict sense, but I think that it is enough for us for today. So 
somehow one can say that cognitive science is a naturalized epistemology. Of course, if we uh, think about the ideas of naturalizing epistemology, there are some approaches as Susan Hack, for instance, uh, nicely described, described, but uh, the most popular option or the most discussed option is Quine's uh, replacement idea that epistemology should be replaced, replaced by uh, psychology or in, by cognitive science, because this is something scientific. And if we want to understand cognitive processes, then we should, um, we should look into what cognitive science scientists can tell us about this. So cognitive science uh, is, of course, descriptive. There is a broad discussion about the normativity of uh, some statements and so on, but uh, generally speaking, cognitive science is descriptive. The aim is to describe some mental phenomena, to describe cognitive processes that underlie our cognition. And what about law? Law is, of course, normative. There are many descriptive presuppositions, for instance, uh, pres presuppositions or assumptions that lie behind legal norms. And there are many, many basic uh, descriptive presuppositions. For instance, that people exist, a yeah, very basic fundamental uh, assumption or presupposition of almost all legal norms. And there are many, many, many others. And uh, the more uh, complex these presuppositions are, the more controversial from a philosophical point of view they are, of course. But generally speaking, law is normative. The aim of law is to regulate behavior of people. So the first questions, the first question that can be asked is a very basic one. Why a descriptive, um, descriptive branch of um, science? Okay, all science are descriptive, but let's put it aside. Why cognitive science that is descriptive can be relevant for something that is normative, namely law. And this question uh, can be asked also in another way. If we uh, agree that this is not a big problem, that something that is descriptive can be relevant for law, for instance, because there are many descriptive presuppositions of all normative statements, then we should ask another question. How can cognitive science be relevant for theories concerning legal cognition? And how should we understand naturalization of law? And my way of uh, understanding of naturalization is a very simple one, but I think it is the best one, at least in the context of cognitive legal studies, namely that naturalization is coherence uh, between the knowledge concerning human cognition and descriptive assumptions of law, of legal norms, and generally speaking of legal science. So uh, if, uh, if law is naturalized, that means that it is coherent with scientific knowledge. So descriptive presuppositions of law are coherent with descriptive statements of cognitive science. Of course, if we think about cognitive science, the part that is important is the part about human cognition. So uh, for instance, if we have some legal norms about um, let's say making contracts or generally speaking decision making uh, or judicial decision making in particular, then we can ask whether these assumptions, these presuppositions are coherent with what cognitive science tells us about human decision making processes. And the same about conceptual processing. If we have some presuppositions about how do lawyers think, then we can check whether these presuppositions are coherent with what cognitive science tells us about how people think. And what are examples of uh, this, um, let's say, 
parts of cognitive science that can be relevant for legal philosophy and law in general. First of all, conceptual processing that I mentioned uh, one minute ago. For instance, we can ask question, how does our mind process the concepts? And what are concepts? In legal theory, we have many definitions of legal concepts, but the fundamental question is what concepts are. Uh, and for instance, if we accept a dominant position in contemporary cognitive science, at least it seems that this position is dominant, that concepts are mental representations, then perhaps we should ask a question, what does it mean that legal concepts as are mental representations? And how can abstract, especially abstract legal concepts represent something? Something, if they are abstract, then they represent something that is abstract. Something that is abstract, abstract objects, do not exist in the physical sense. And to be honest, most probably they do not exist in general. So how can we have a representation of something that doesn't exist? That's the first question and that's the first problem that we face when we want to naturalize theory of legal concepts. Another question, another, question, another problem, interpretations. What are the mechanisms that underlie the process of interpretation of language? And here we have uh, research concerning mental simulation and language understanding. Uh, for instance, research conducted by Glenberg and Kashak, American philosophers or American cognitive scientist Benjamin Bergen. And the last question that I have already mentioned, what are the mechanisms that underlie the process of decision making? And if we think about decision making, of course, the first thing that comes to our mind is the research on heuristics and how they influence our decision making processes. So that's, that's the first part. Why is cognitive science relevant for legal philosophy? Because if we do not naturalize law or legal philosophy, because that's what's most interesting for us today, then our theories will not be, or rather will be outdated. They will be based on some folk intuitions rather than scientific research. So that's my answer to this question. The second question is why cognitive legal studies? So why, if we want to naturalize law, uh, why do we need cognitive sciences? And why uh, should we, of course, that's the question whether we should, but let's assume that we should. Why mm, cognitive legal studies? No, of course, the answer is quite obvious because um, epistemology of law is a crucial part of legal theory. If we want to understand legal interpretation, legal decision-making processes, then we need to understand legal cognition. And if naturalized epistemology um, should be based or should be replaced by, if we accept this more radical interpretation, uh, should be inspired by cognitive sciences, then our legal studies that are naturalized should be cognitive legal studies. And this, this term cognitive legal studies uh, was uh, proposed by uh, George Lakoff and Stephen Winter. Uh, Stephen Winter is perhaps the, the most famous legal philosopher who was inspired by uh, contemporary cognitive sciences, especially by uh, theories of categorization, of embodied cognition, metaphor theory, and so on. And um, I really like this, this name, cognitive legal studies, uh, because it describes, in my opinion, really well what we want to do. We want to study law in light of the cognitive sciences, and we want to study this cognitive aspect of law. Namely, we are not interested in the, in the question, for instance, 
what is the nature of legal objects? A very important question, but from the perspective of cognitive legal studies, we are interested not in, in ontological metaphysical problems, but rather in epistemological problems. And that's why cognitive legal studies. And of course, the relation between scientific knowledge concerning cognition and legal knowledge or law, uh, speaking in more general terms, is typically analyzed in the context of law in action. The opportunities of practical application of advances in neuroscience in legal procedures. And of course, we have this um, quite popular, I think, uh, paradigm of neuro law that gained popularity, especially, especially in the United States. But uh, not only neuroscience is, is relevant. Neuroscience can be more important in exactly in practice, in legal practice, law in action. For instance, we, we know all this debate concerning uh, standards of evidence evaluation and so on. And this, this debate in the United States and not only in the US uh, is uh, very often um, analyzed in the context of neuroscientific evidence. But what I want to speak about today is not only neuroscience. Of course, neuroscience is a part of cognitive science. But still, I, I will rather focus on more theoretical research uh, that concerns some basic cognitive processes. And if we think about cognitive legal studies, I think that we can identify at least three positions, three philosophical attitudes towards the significance or relevance of cognitive science for law. And let me just briefly describe these three options that we have. The first option is optimism. And optimism uh, is um, a view that cognitive science is truly important for legal, legal studies, for legal theory, and that cognitive science can be a source of revolution in legal theory. So the, in my opinion, these two elements are important. First, the, the, the answer yes to the question if cognitive science is relevant. And the second part, that cognitive science can be a source of revolution in legal theory. So. Uh, for instance, if, if you uh, are familiar with Stephen Winter's works, uh, I think that they are very optimistic in this sense. So first, Winter claims that cognitive science is very important for legal theory and that it can be a source of revolution in legal theory or in the field of legal studies, jurisprudence and so on. Um, I think that this view is too optimistic. So um, yes, cognitive science is relevant and cognitive legal studies are something important in the contemporary legal theory, but I am not sure if there is a room for real revolution. And in the next parts of my talk, I will try to explain why. Uh, the second position that is quite opposite is pessimism. And there are at least two forms of pessimism. Uh, the first uh, form of pessimism is philosophical pessimism. For instance, that you can find in, uh, in, in, in uh, writings of uh, Hans Kelsen and other uh, philosophers inspired by him. Uh, of course, uh, cognitive science uh, is a relatively new invention and uh, Kelsen uh, didn't uh, mention cognitive science in his, in his uh, philosophical uh, papers. But uh, when we think about his position that, that was inspired by um, uh, neo-Kantianism, uh, Marburg School, uh, this is something that is a good example of anti-naturalistic stance in legal philosophy. So 
this is something that is based not on the evaluation of the contemporary cognitive science, but this is something that has its roots in a certain philosophical stance. The second form of pessimism is based not on, uh, for instance, uh, Marburg Neocantianism or other philosophical school, but is rather based on the evaluation of the contemporary cognitive science. And this form is pessimism. Um, I, I, I call it methodological pessimism. And this is something that to some extent I share. So uh, I will tell more about this later, but according to this form of pessimism, we simply cannot um, apply cognitive sciences in legal philosophy and legal theory because cognitive sciences are inconclusive. Because there are so many competing theories, there are so many competing research paradigms that we, as lawyers and philosophers, we simply don't know which one is appropriate and which one should we choose. Because we are not cognitive scientists, so we don't know which option is the best one. And even more, cognitive scientists do not know because they argue about their theories and there is a big discussion, for instance, concerning embodied and disembodied cognition and so on. And the third position that is uh, moderate, so it's in the middle, it's, be, it's between optimism and pessimism, is what I call moderate pronaturalism. So we have a combination of both optimistic and pessimistic elements. And um, according to this uh, position, cognitive science is relevant and in, it can enrich our philosophical analysis and it can help to us to create better legal theory but first of all it is not a source and it cannot even be a source of revolution in legal theory and secondly we should be very very cautious when we um, propose new ideas uh, based on naturalization of law so if we want to, for instance, offer a naturalized theory of legal concepts, then we should have in mind that it's very that it is a very difficult task, and that most probably uh, this theory will not be conclusive because uh, theories developed within the cognitive sciences are not conclusive. So these are three uh, three possibilities, and. Uh, in the next part, I will try to explain why we should choose one of these three approaches. But first, let me just let me just check the time. OK, but first, uh, let me just very briefly uh, introduce a case study on conceptual processing and legal reasoning. And I will only focus on these issues that are relevant for uh, the next part of my presentation. So. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction that according to cognitive sciences, concepts are mental representations. Of course, there are many theories of concepts and uh, this is one of these theories, but according to many scholars in the field of cognitive science, this is a default view on concepts. So concepts are mental representation. But even if we accept this view that concepts are not words, that concepts are some uh, mental phenomena, then it doesn't mean that we have uh, solved this problem of concepts. Because first of all, we have to ask a question, are, co are mental representations embodied or disembodied? And this is, uh, very, this is uh, one, perhaps one of the most important debates in the contemporary cognitive sciences that concerns the embodied cognition. Embodied cognition is a research program uh, that um, was uh, and still is quite popular and uh, influential in the cognitive sciences and cognitive psychology. And according to this uh, research program, uh, when, if we want to understand the mechanisms of our cognition, 
uh, we should focus on our body and the interactions of our body with the environment. So uh, this is um, a view that emerged in opposition to the so-called classical theories of cognition, according to which uh, we use representations that are amodal, not modal, but amodal. What does it mean? Amodal representations are representations that are not directly linked to our perceptual experience. And modal representations are representations that are linked to our perceptual experience and our interactions with the environment, our bodily uh, interactions. So the first question that uh, we have to ask if we want to naturalize theory of legal concepts is whether we should accept embodied or disembodied approach to mental representations. And there is no uh, clear answer to this question because there are many researchers who still adhere to embodied cognition and there are many influential researchers who do not agree with uh, embodied cognition. And I will give you just one example. Uh, an experiment conducted by Glenberg and Kashak 21 years ago that uh, was treated as one of the basic experiments that confirms um, that embodied cognition, at least to some extent, is, is, is true. Uh, that people, when they understand language, they use mental simulation that is based on our previous experiences and that our thinking is embodied. Uh, I, I don't want to go into details uh, because uh, I know that I am running out of time uh, and I will have to consume additional five minutes, so sorry for this. But um, the problem is that this experiment that was treated as something really important uh, was not confirmed later. So, um, of course, we have a big problem that is named, this is called replication problem in the cognitive sciences, especially in social psychology and so on. But uh, the problem is that even if you have a very nice experiment that uh, is used as an argument for a particular theory, then we cannot be sure that this idea will not be falsified in future. That first of all, we don't know whether this will be corroborated by other experiments and that replication uh, process will, um, will, be, um, will res result uh, with successes. And the second problem is that even if we have a good replication process, then we even then cannot be sure that later experiments will not corroborate something totally opposite. So that's the first, first problem if we want to make good cognitive legal studies. We have many approaches in cognitive sciences and we have very different theories that describe the same mechanism and we simply don't know which one we should choose. And another problem, uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that if we think about legal concepts, they are many abstract concepts because crucial legal concepts are abstract concepts, obligation, law, justice, and so on. If we agree that all these concepts are legal concepts, of course, I know that it's also uh, disputable, but let's assume they are legal concepts, then they are abstract legal concepts. And for instance, if we accept embodied cognition, so if we accept that conceptual processing is based on perceptual information that we received, then how can we have embodied abstract concepts? And there is a remedy for this in, co in cognitive science, namely metaphor theory, conceptual metaphor theory, which is also uh, a theory that is very controversial, but still very influential one. Uh, but we have to ask, are ask a question, are all abstract legal concepts metaphorical? If no, uh, if not, 
then uh, is this metaphor theory appropriate or rather should we focus on hybrid theories that are developed nowadays hybrid theories that are inspired by um theory of alan paivio dual coding theory and according to these theories uh, both embodied and disembodied cognition is true to some extent uh, so uh, if we agree with this then other theories are false and if we agree with dual coding theory then we have to reject other theories that are also quite well empirically corroborated and um, okay so perhaps th this part is not crucial uh, for for my talk this is about the relation between uh, legal language and legal concepts that are representations but if we are interested we, i can go back to this uh, in in the discussion part uh, but what is important for us and what is the basic problem of cognitive legal studies is theoretical pluralism of course it is not one can say it's not a real problem because such theoretical pluralism is something that is crucial for all scientific uh, disciplines of course yes but uh, if we want to think about cognitive legal studies and if we want to make a revolution in uh, legal theory revolution that originates in cognitive sciences uh, as some uh, contemporary legal theorists legal philosophers want then we have to think about this basic problem if and again just uh, i i'm i'm just talking about this case study this is one of many 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 similar problems that we are facing when we want to naturalize law uh, if we want to create naturalized theory of legal concepts then which approach to legal concepts should we adopt embodied approach or disembodied approach and all uh, both of these uh, theories both of these approaches generate problems in the context of legal concepts and in general they generate many theoretical and empirical problems so uh, this is the first uh, limitation of cognitive legal studies uh, if we want to naturalize the law in the sense that i proposed uh, in the first part of my talk that naturalization of law is making descriptive assumptions of legal norms coherent with uh, the cognitive science then we have to ask first of all which assumptions but this is not so uh, problematic the second question is crucial coherent with what part of scientific knowledge because even if we take into account, account this quite unpopular problem of conceptual processing and the nature of legal concepts then we face a real problem should we make our theory of legal concepts coherent with the embodied approach or with the disembodied approach or perhaps with the dual coding approach and contemporary hybrid theories of legal concepts of course this is a part of a more general question is it po possible to naturalize philosophy because if we want to naturalize philosophy and we want to make our assumptions our presuppositions coherent with the scientific knowledge then this question seems to be relevant with what part of scientific knowledge which theory should we adopt if we want to naturalize a specific branch of philosophy or specific branch of legal theory and this is uh, what i call uh, tension problem uh, i described this this problem in um, in my paper that was published recently in ratio Iuris. so if you are interested uh, please let me know and i can share pdf with you but uh, very briefly a strong tension problem is as follows 
Legal philosophy should be informed by cognitive science. It should be naturalized. That's, of course, a certain position, theoretical position, uh, and it is debate debatable, of course, it's controversial, but if we accept this position, because if we don't agree with this, there is no tension problem, sure. And we don't want to make cognitive legal studies. But if we, if we accept this idea that law should be naturalized, then we have a problem because we should also accept second, uh, this second sentence. Legal philosophy should not be informed by cognitive science due to the inconclusiveness of the theories developed within cognitive science. And if we agree that theories developed within the cognitive sciences are not conclusive, and I really do not think that this can be controversial, uh, because if you, if you open any uh, psychological journal, uh, then you will find many papers uh, that describe the same phenomena and the same mechanism in completely different ways. So um, there's a strong tension problem. If we want to naturalize law, if we want to make cognitive legal studies, then we should not do uh, cognitive legal studies because we can't. But of course, this is a strong tension problem because uh, this is it's a very radical way of describing this uh, this problem, uh, and these elements can also be formulated in a weaker form. And the difference is in the second proposition: uh, legal theory should be informed by the cognitive sciences; it should be naturalized. That's the same. And the second, methodological caution is necessary due to the inconclusiveness of the theories developed within cognitive sciences. If possible, general assumptions accepted by the scientific community should be harnessed more than peculiar competing theories. And this is, uh, I mentioned this methodological caution in the context of uh, this position I called moderate pronaturalism. And this is perhaps a tension problem that is acceptable for someone who wants to make cognitive legal studies. But if we want to accept and use only uh, general assumptions that are accepted by the scientific community, I'm not sure if these general assumptions can be useful for us, for lawyers, for legal philosophers, because such general assumption is, for example, that legal concepts are mental representations because concepts are representations. Let's say, let's assume that this is a general assumption that is shared by uh, the scientific community. But what does it tell us about legal concepts? Not too much, because we don't know what is the nature of these representations, how these representations are processed by our brains, because all these issues are very controversial and there are many different positions about these mechanisms. So a uh, weak tension problem perhaps is not a big problem for us if we want to make cognitive legal studies, but still is a real problem. And this is, in my opinion, a basic limitation of cognitive legal studies. We need cognitive legal studies, but we really do not know how to make our results reliable because we, are, we cannot be sure if the theory that we accept is reliable theory. And one can say it's, it's not a problem at all because uh, that's the problem of science in general and uh, to be honest, it's not a problem because uh, Larry Loudon uh, knew well that we have a problem of pessimistic meta-induction that all theories that people uh, created uh, and uh, they believe these theories are adequate then were falsified. So all our theories also will be falsified and so on and so on. That all our theories, the best theories that we have now they all will be falsified. So to be honest, they are false. And uh, even if they are false, it's, it's still better 
uh, to naturalize law because these theories are epistemically more reliable than armchair theories. And okay, I can agree with this uh, position to some extent, but again, I think that tension problem uh, is not merely philosophical hair splitting, because if we forget about this tension problem, uh, then there is a risk that we will accept some theories uh, developed by the cognitive scientists, by neuroscientists and so on, and that we will believe that these theories are adequate or even true. And then we will be sure that our theory that is a philosophical theory that is naturalized will be true. But of course, it's, it's not the case. On the one hand, we all know that uh, there are no true theories. And this is a truism, of course. But on the second hand, if we analyze uh, the publications of legal philosophers who are inspired by different theories developed within the cognitive scientists, uh, cognitive sciences um, developed within neuroscience sciences, then I think that sometimes they forget about it. And they think that they, their theory is naturalized and it's much, much better than the armchair philosophy. I can agree it is better, but we should always have in mind that uh, we need this methodological caution and naturalization of law is a very, very problematic endeavor. So uh, sorry for uh, taking too much time. Let me just uh, go to conclusions. First of all, cognitive science seems to be relevant for legal philosophy in many dimensions. Th that's in, I can agree with this, and I think that many people today agree with this uh, position. They adhere to this position, but it is not an easy task to naturalize jurisprudence because we do not know, and what is more, we cannot know which scientific theories we should choose. And we don't know, and we perhaps even can't know, how should we justify our choice. And this tension problem is not, it's not a problem that undermines uh, the naturalistic uh, perspective uh, of legal theory. Of course not. But I think that this is a problem that uh, is crucial if we want to create a responsible methodology of cognitive legal studies. If we forget about this tension, if we forget about uh, this problem of uh, many competing theories developed within the cognitive sciences, then uh, I think that we can be too naive in the context of naturalizing jurisprudence. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will be very happy to answer uh, you, your questions uh, if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marek, for this wonderful presentation. Um, we can now officially move on to the second part, to the Q&A part, um, which allows the participants to ask questions and make comments by raising their virtual hand. So, people, the floor is yours, if anyone wants to. Um, while we're waiting for uh, others to, to ask questions, um, I guess I have a few. Um, first of all, um, I would like to hear what's your take on other empirical sciences and their possible value for the naturalization of legal theory. Um, you've been mostly focused on uh, psychology and uh, neurosciences, but would you say that, for example, uh, Sociology is important in that aspect, and uh, is there any possibility or room 
for natural sciences such as for example biology in some sense or is it um actually embodied in in the idea of neurosciences and so on um so that's my first question secondly um i'm not certain if i would completely agree with the pessimistic argument um of not knowing which theory is plausible you've mentioned that quite a lot when it comes to relying on findings in neurosciences and psychology in general um but if we have in mind um the the general limitations of our epistemology and for example some of the arguments such as popper's about um assumptions and refutations uh, as the whole methodology of sciences, uh, meaning that it, it's a, a dynamic process which uh, is never fully determined, um, would it give us enough space to say, fine, even though it's not conclusive, uh, we can use some of the findings, um, even though they could be uh, uh, contradictory in some sense, if, even if uh, they are not uh, completely aligned with one another. We can use uh, one of them and say, fine, this gives us some sort of a correlation with um, our empirical aspects with experience in general. And it could explain in some sense, which is, I guess, uh, a bit more moderate approach to understanding uh, how naturalization helps us and in, in, uh, to which extent. So we can be satisfied with just correlations and um, uh, small findings which lead to, to the whole puzzle. Um, so th that's the second part. And third, I guess um, it's more of a comment regarding your first concern um, about the relation between is and ought, because law is normative and sciences are in general descriptive. Um, I guess I would say, which is, uh, in a way, a defense of naturalization that uh, even if we accept the traditional view that an odd cannot be derived from an is and the other way around, uh, logically speaking, we can uh, also say that uh, it's quite plausible to think that we uh, make ideas, meaning also concepts, which you've mentioned, mental concepts, but also have normative claims, value claims, which are not completely separate from experience. Uh, even though we cannot logically mm -hmm. conceive uh, uh, such a connection, it's, I guess, uh, more of a fundamental epistemological claim uh, that everything comes from experience. So wouldn't that solve uh, the, the general um, uh, worry that that uh, there is a tension between those two. And in the end, I would just like to hear a bit more uh, about the embodied and disembodied uh, mental conceptions. You haven't had enough time for that, but I'm not certain if I grasped it fully. So if you could just uh, focus a bit more on that also. Uh, All right. Yeah. And I guess uh, it's just a recommendation. I suggest we collect the questions first, if that's fine with you. I'm not sur sure. Uh, All right. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, write them down because I, 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 I'm afraid I will forget about all these okay. uh, issues. Um, okay. Uh, we also have Boan, Silvia, and Pedro, who has written his question in the comments. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. no, uh, he has to leave. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm ready. So, uh, please, uh, okay. there are any other questions, please. Silvia, uh, yes, please. Am I to ask a question now? Yes, yes, go yes, on. Yes, yes, please, please. Hmm? Okay. Um, I'm a little bit uh, 
surprised that uh, you think that unconclusiveness of uh, com um, cognitive science is uh, some problem for applying it to um, legal science because um, conclusiveness uh, is not needed for science as a matter of fact um, but it's uh, needed for law as the social phenomena uh, a, a phenomenon uh, but uh, legal sciences are not conclusive at all even in this state which uh, we have uh, now uh, we have a lot of different uh, theories and different uh, concepts um, concerning law um, even uh, within our internal enterprise uh, which is uh, the legal science and uh, if we uh, if we believe in your uh, warnings that unco unconclusiveness of uh, cognitive science is so dangerous uh, we um, will be somehow closed for uh, new uh, theories and new uh, concepts um, which I think is uh, somehow dangerous in the other way um, and I uh, and I think that if we uh, treat your warnings seriously we should also uh, reject uh, economic uh, economics uh, and sociology and uh, other uh, social sciences um, as a um, way of um, of making legal science uh, too so uh, why are you so sure that conclusiveness is so important for legal science because for me it's important but for law and not for legal science thank you thank you thank you Boyan. please go ahead um, thank you for, for the interesting presentation, Marek. I had a, a quite a similar question to the one posed by Sylvia, um, but uh, let me try to formulate it from a different perspective. Uh, but it's also about conclusiveness. So, if if our initial question is whether, so I, I'll formulate it as two question, two questions. What it is, what is it that should be naturalized? Is it legal science, like Sylvia mentioned a couple of times? The way I understood it is that the naturaliz naturalization would encompass mostly legal philosophies. So, if it encompasses legal philosophy, uh, my question would be: um, Would uh, um, a consequent account entail uh, the claim that philosophy of law should be measured by the yardsticks of natural science or by the yardsticks of cognitive science uh, and not as you for example i understood you to claim mm, that we have this criterion of decisiveness for example um, regarding our evaluations of cognitive science. If this is the right way to put it, then we could, for example, uh, we could, for example, um, cl claim or wonder why is this conclusiveness um, so important for philosophy of law, or why should it be important when we don't find um, anything similar in in any of the sciences, not even in the hard sciences, even if we just take into account whatever physics, um, not just, we find it, of course, we find it in, in mathematics, <laughs> we could maybe find it in logic in this sense, but we don't find it in empirical sciences and naturalization usually has to do with the methodology of empirical sciences and, and the epistemology of empirical sciences. I hope that I haven't. Okay, I know that I didn't make myself clear, but hopefully I didn't make myself confusing too much. 
Thanks. I, I think I, I, I got your, your point, so I will try to, to answer this. Thanks. So, yeah, you can go ahead, Marek. I, okay, I guess okay. Now. thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for all questions. Uh, very interesting and uh, important questions, I, I think. And um, some of them are, are truly difficult, but difficult questions are the best questions. So, uh, starting with your uh, comments, Saba. Uh, when it comes to uh, different uh, areas of knowledge, uh, various area of, areas of knowledge that can be useful, I think I'm not an expert in sociology, so uh, I don't think that I should express my position about uh, naturalization of law uh, in the light of uh, sociological theories. And of course, this will be um, rather weak naturalization or liberal naturalization uh, when compared to biology or cognitive sciences, because sociology is uh, social science. But some people think that uh, psychology is a social science uh, first rather than empirical science. So, of course, it's, it's uh, a bit complicated, but uh, I am sure that uh, sociology can give us uh, very important insights when it comes, for instance, to the um, efficiency of law, uh, the theories of uh, judges' behavior and also decision-making processes. Uh, um, when it comes to biology, um, I am, I am not uh, also, um, this is not my area of research, but I know some publications that uh, I think show that this can be also a good uh, source of scientific knowledge. For instance, uh, my colleague uh, from the Jagiellonian, Wojciech Zawuski, uh, published several books about uh, this approach, uh, evolutionary legal philosophy, and uh, he has um, analyzed many issues that are relevant for legal theorists and legal philosophers um, um, by applying uh, some insights from evolutionary biology. So I think that this approach can also be very useful. And, uh, and now just answering your, uh, that was something common in all these comments that perhaps I am uh, too, opti uh, too pessimistic. And please believe me, I am, I am not very pessimist pessimistic. I, the only thing I want to stress is that the basic limitation, uh, and I will go back to this later, the basic limitation that we have to think about when we want to make cognitive legal studies is this pluralism of the sources of naturalization. And of course, that's the basic feature of science, that science is not a matter of truth, it's a matter of discussion, it's a matter of uh, falsification and so on. And I totally agree with all these theories. I am even more skeptical than, uh, than perhaps m many of you. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, I don't like cognitive legal studies because I like it and I try to, to make this uh, research. So. Uh, the problem that I um, that I have encountered when I wanted to apply uh, embodied cognition theories into the research uh, in legal theory was was really this problem that if I want to say something about legal concepts, what can I say? I can only say that there are many many options. That uh, first of all, I can accept that concepts are modal or that I are a model or that I'll hybrid and so on. And if, uh, if I want to be a reliable researcher in the field of legal theory, and if I want to make my papers adequate, I cannot say that these concepts, legal concepts are uh, this, this kind of mental representations, but rather that they, they are this kind in the light of this theory, this kind on the light in this theory and so on and so on. And I think that this is something that we sometimes forget about. Uh, perhaps this is hair splitting. Some people think it is hair splitting, but I cannot agree because I think that if I, for instance, publish a paper in which I, I, I say uh, legal concepts are model embodied mental representations uh, and I defend this view, then 
I, I have in mind that, okay, this is a nice hypothesis that can be, uh, that is uh, even empirically grounded, but I know that the theory that lies behind this hypothesis and this, um, my, my own position expressed in this paper is a very controversial position. And I know perfectly that we can say the same about all our papers that we have prepared. I know, but uh, there is uh, something like um, a, a spirit of time today uh, that if we naturalize something, it is better than uh, armchair philosophy, that empirically grounded, empirical grounded theory is better. And of course, it, I, I agree, it is better. Not in all cases, not in all disciplines, but for instance, if you think about legal cognition, then yes, it is better. But again, we cannot forget that it is not the, the only option. And it is not even not a matter of this pessimistic meta induction and uh, the belief that our theories are false, false, and they will be falsified in future. It is matter of the uh, st current state of uh, cognitive science that we cannot say that concepts are this, 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 this have this, 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 these features, because they have these features only in light of this research paradigm or even this one particular theory. And if we take into account another theory, then we have another approach. So uh, that's, that's the first thing. So answering Sava, your first uh, comment, I think that uh, even if we take into account uh, biology, there are, for instance, some uh, different interpretations of evolutionary biology and some basic tenets of these theories, then we'll face the same or similar problem. Um, uh, uh, you, you also mentioned that um, at the beginning of my talk, uh, I um, told that there is a problem uh, if we think about the significance of cognitive science for law uh, that lies at this intersection between, uh, or rather uh, not intersection, but uh, separation between is and ought. And uh, I, I just mentioned it because uh, I, I um, s sometimes when I talk to people uh, that are not in, they are legal philosophers, but they are not interested and they, 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 they simply uh, do not write about uh, legal theory and legal cognitive sciences in this epistemological um, view, in, uh, sorry, in this naturalistic uh, approach. They often say that, okay, but this is descriptive, this is normative, this is a total difference. Of course, I agree with you. I agree with your argument totally, but I also, I mentioned it not because I think it is a problem because I really don't think it's a problem, but I only mentioned because this approach that is based on the idea that there is descriptive uh, assumption or presupposition of legal norm and that this makes a link between the science and the descriptive science and the normative law, that this uh, assumption make this link possible in the light of this approach to naturalization that I mentioned, that natural, naturalization is uh, making uh, descriptive assumptions coherent with the cognitive sciences. So uh, this, this is not my concern. I, I really don't think it's a problem, but I know that many people think that this is a problem. And that's the basic, the, the basic um, idea that why cognitive legal studies if we have cognitive science and law, something different. And that's why I, I mentioned uh, this, um, uh, this uh, link between and this way of understanding of naturalization. And you also mentioned that um, this uh, idea of embodiment is not clear. I am totally aware because uh, it was a very, very, very brief introduction. Uh, so, um, uh, perhaps let me go back uh, also briefly, but uh, we can also discuss later if, if, if you want, of course, um, uh, very briefly about this um, difference between um, embodied and disembodied cognition, because perhaps that's something that is crucial. Um, if we look at the history of cognitive sciences, it is not very long history, but uh, a very intense one, uh, we have two main approaches from a historical point of view. 
we have uh, the so-called classical view of mind and cognition, and we have embodied view. And of course, this would be a simplification, but let me just try to explain it in a few words. Um, according to this classical theory of uh, cognition, uh, our mind processes representations that are amodal. So they are quasi-linguistic. And this is, I am sure you are all familiar with uh, Jerry Fodor's theory of language of thought. And according to this theory, again, with a broad bash, um, when we think, we, our brain processes symbols that are amodal, that are quasi-linguistic, and these uh, representations uh, are not linked to our uh, experiences. So, of course, we receive information via senses, but then this information is transformed into this amodal form. And our cognitive processes are based on processing of amodal representations. According to embodied view, uh, our cognitive processes are based on processing modal representations. And this is, uh, I, this can be explained uh, by um, pointing the, the most important part of mental simulation theory. According to mental simulation theory, that is a basic theory uh, for, for embodied view, I, I, I think that one can say uh, this in this way about this theory. When we process concepts and when we think, because a cognition and thinking are, are sometimes treated as synonym in, in cognitive science. Not all agree with this, but let's say that cognition and thinking are, are the same process or are based on the same mechanisms. Um, when we think, let's say I think about a cat. I also have a cat, so I, I really like uh, yours. Um, when I think about a cat, and I close my eyes and I don't look at uh, my screen right now when I can see a cat, uh, all my past interactions with, cat, with cats will be, let's say, reactivated. And this is observed in neuro, uh, in fMRI studies, um, because uh, when people think about something, so they process concepts representing some objects, then uh, the parts of their brains are active, that are active when they have interactions with these objects. So, uh, for instance, if I think about a cat, uh, the same part of my brain is active, uh, that is active when I see a cat or I touch a cat and so on. I have interactions with cats and I have perceptual information about cats. So uh, this is, and this is really well corroborated because there, there are many studies and this is for instance, described by Lawrence Barsalou, uh, Guy Dove and other researchers, other psychologists. And this is a really well corroborated idea and theory that when we think about something, we simulate objects that are uh, represented by concepts that we are processing. And uh, okay, the, and the, after this quite long story, uh, this according to disembodied cognition, our concepts are not perceptual in nature, so are not are amodal, not modal. And according to embodied cognition, they are modal in the sense that they are directly linked to mental simulation. And of course, this theory of mental simulation is really, really well confirmed. But again, we have a problem when we think about abstract concepts, because abstract concepts do not represent uh, real objects that can be perceived and we can have no information and no bodily interactions with these objects. And this is uh, very problematic for lawyers if they want to apply this theory, because in, in law, crucial concepts are abstract. Yeah, I, I mentioned in my, my talk, I mentioned law, justice, obligation, and many, many others. 
Uh, and if these concepts are abstract, how can this concept be explained in the light of embodied cognition? And here, uh, metaphor theory um, is one of the possible solutions that these abstract concepts are embodied, but not directly because they are metaphors. They are based on metaphorical simulation. So, but uh, why I introduced this uh, case study uh, during my talk? Because I think that it shows uh, that we really do not know which approach should be adopted in creating naturalized theory of legal cognition. And that's that's why I mentioned this, this theory. Uh, all right. Um, uh, Sava, are you satisfied with my uh, answers? Very much, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank, so you. thank you, thank you for your questions. And uh, now uh, Professor Sylvia Wojczak asked a question, um, why uh, is conclusiveness needed, needed for us if uh, we want to naturalize law and make cognitive legal studies uh, if it is not necessary for, for uh, science in general? And of course, uh, there is a pluralism of, th of theories within legal theory, and we know it uh, quite well that legal philosophers argue about different approaches to different problems. That's, that's of course, true. And uh, one important point, I really do not think that uh, these problems that I identified in my talk, especially the tension problem, I don't think that this leads us to um, rejection of uh, the relevance of science for law. Absolutely not. Uh, I think that the only uh, thing we have to remember about is this limitation, because, of course, it is better to create a theory of legal cognition based on a specific uh, theory developed within the cognitive sciences, because it, it will always tell us, tell us more than a pure philosophical theory. I, that, that's my opinion. But uh, we cannot forget that there are different theories and we cannot say that, okay, we have, I have created, let's say, a theory of legal concepts as mental representations. And now I know that ah, all other theories are wrong and my, only my theory is the correct one. Uh, I really think that we have to remember that this theory is adequate and naturalized only in light of one particular theory developed within the cognitive sciences. Because in light of uh, competing theories, my theory is false. And one can say, okay, if my philosophical theory, if my naturalized philosophical theory is false, it's really great thing because I have a theory that is falsif falsifiable. And it is much, much better than to have a theory that cannot be falsified. Of course, of course, that's true. If we think about the, the, the contemporary philosophy of science, that's true. It's, it's much, much better to have a, a, a theory that is adequate only in light of one particular uh, theory developed within cognitive sciences and that can be falsified because my philosophical theory will be falsified when this uh, theory that is the source of naturalization is falsified, of course. So, uh, why, you, you asked me why uh, I think that conclusiveness is so important. And it's not about, uh, I don't know, epistemological purism. Absolutely not. Uh, it is uh, rather about the real methodological problems that we face when we try to apply cognitive science in legal theory. Because, uh, again, this, 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 this one example, if we want to naturalize theory of legal concepts, great. Uh, if we agree that legal concepts are mental representations, 
and let's treat this assumption as this general basic assumption of cognitive science great but then uh, we should analyze uh, legal concepts in the light of uh, a particular theory of mental representations of, because if i want to explain how legal concepts are processed by our brains i have to accept one of these theories because i cannot propose a coherent view of legal concepts if i accept simultaneously uh, embodied approach disembodied approach hybrid approach and so on i have to choose one of these theories and i think that a real trouble is at this moment which one theory should i choose and what tools as a lawyer as a philosopher do i have to choose one of these theories because i can find really good arguments for all these theories all these theories are corroborated by some empirical studies and all these results were published in really well and prestigious journal so what are my tools to choose one of these theories if i want to explain legal concepts or anything else or for instance legal decision making what theory is the best one for me and what tools do i have to choose this one particular theory if they are inconsistent if uh, they are not conclusive because they are not and that's 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 my concern and it's not that uh so we we should not naturalize law because i think that we should do it but my concern is that to be honest we don't know how exactly we should do it because we have no tool to choose this one theory that will be the best theory and even if we agree that there are always many competing theories that's true and we, if we agree that uh, it would be naive to think that only one theory is true i can agree of course but it's not it's not an epistemological problem a purely epistemological problem because i can agree with all of you that from an epistemological perspective it's not a big problem because it's something that we just have to accept that we have many different competing theories but from the methodological perspective i think it is a real problem for everyone who wants to uh, naturalize law in the light of cognitive sciences and not only cognitive science because i am almost sure that uh, in the light of sociology uh, evolutionary biology and other fields we, we would have the same the same or very similar problems um so that's that's my uh, comment to 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 your your comment professor Wojciak. Uh, i don't know if you are satisfied with my reply uh, you didn't convince me <laughs> i just <laughs> think that uh, your questions and your doubts are not specific uh, for cognitive science they are just universal and um, concern all the sci all all the disciplines scientific disciplines and yeah but i agree i agree yes 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 of course i agree because i just said that if we think about sociology and evolutionary biology i think that we uh, we, we we would face similar problems of course but you didn't uh, you didn't uh, observe one uh, interesting thing mm -hmm. that sometimes uh, this uh, competitive theories and concepts uh, coming from cognitive science uh, may be uh, confirmed or uh, maybe confirmed uh, within the legal studies uh, take the metaphorical uh, the, the theory of metaphor of cognitive mm -hmm. metaphor uh, you, uh, you, uh, you know that um, in uh, uh, in the law we have uh, almost uh, almost uh, exclusively uh, abstract uh, concepts uh, and when we uh, 
examine uh, legal texts uh, and the law, we can uh, see that uh, these uh, legal concepts, uh, abstract legal concepts, are very often uh, presented through uh, cognitive metaphors. Uh, so somehow, uh, on the ground of legal sciences, we we can confirm that cogn cognitive suspicion that abstract concepts are metaphorical concepts, and that's the value of using cognitive science. Mm, ah, okay, I, I got your point. Yeah, that, for instance, if we analyze legal concepts and uh, we can identify metaphorical mappings, then mm -hmm. um, uh, we can confirm that uh, legal uh, conceptual give, scheme is largely metaphoric, yeah? Is that, we, is give that something, we give something from legal studies to cognitive science. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, the other direction, not from cognitive science to legal science, uh, legal science, but uh, mm -hmm. opposite. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, uh, that's true, of course. Uh, but again, um, if we find some legal concepts that uh, perhaps are not metaphorical concepts, uh, then uh, it can also be a, a source of uh, further discussions, for instance. So, yes, I, I, I agree with you that uh, if we analyze a particular part of discourse, let's say legal discourse or and legal conceptual scheme, uh, then it can uh, corroborate or falsify some theories and the same concerns, for instance, uh, other other branches. Uh, yes, that's uh, yeah. I, I I was also interested in in legal metaphors and uh, uh, of course I know your works and uh, I know that. Um, uh, there are many legal metaphors and um, that uh, this, this metaphors are also, there are also different kinds of these metaphors and this can give something new to uh, cognitive science and that's what I also wanted to, um, to propose in my publications. Okay, so thank you for, for, for this comment. Uh, Sava, do we have uh, five minutes more? Because I want to answer the last, um, but I don't know if we are. Of course, yeah, yeah. Your timeline is Please. very strict one, or uh, no, no. we are flexible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the last question uh, by uh, asked by Boyan. Um, so um, your question was uh, quite similar uh, to a uh, question asked by. Uh, Professor Wojciak, um, so why conclusiveness is so important for me if we do not have conclusiveness, if there is no conclusiveness in, um, in, in science in general, if I, uh, under, um, if I, um, uh, if I remember your question um, well. So, um, yes, but again, I can say, uh, I can just, um, um, I can just, uh, Oh my God, I forgot a very basic word in English, sorry. Uh, I can just say the same that I said uh, several minutes ago. It's not about epistemological uh, purism or perfectionism. Of course, uh, there is no conclusiveness uh, in science in general, and there is no conclusiveness in philosophy. And uh, it's a good question. Why uh, is it a problem for me in the context of cognitive legal studies? But I can, I can only uh, answer in the same way. Uh, it's not an epistemological problem. For me, it is a real problem when I want to apply uh, cognitive science in the field of legal philosophy or legal theory, because I simply do not know how to do it if I have different competing theories, for instance, about legal concepts. So, uh, of course, I know it's, it's and I, I uh, wanted to stress it during my talk, perhaps it wasn't expressed, um, it, it wasn't expressed um, very clearly, but uh, I don't think that this is a problem that undermines this naturalistic endeavor, absolutely not. I am not a pessimist. I am rather a moderate pro-naturalist, and that means that 
uh, I really I think that uh, these limitations and this methodological caution is something that we really should um, uh, we should think about and that should be stressed in um, in uh, this uh, in in all our attempts to naturalize uh, naturalize jurisprudence. So. So that's that's my that's my answer and that's that's my comment to your comment rather than question. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marek, once again for the great presentation and the answers and comments of uh, all of you. Um, it was wonderful having you with us, and uh, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but I just wanted to thank you again. It was really a pleasure to, to have this invitation and uh, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion, very good questions. I know this is a controversial topic, but I always think that only controversial presentations are interesting. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your questions and comments. You're welcome. And uh, the complexity of the questions and the topic made us uh, exceed the time limit. So that's quite indicative. Um, next week, we'll have Dan Priel with us, which will be uh, an excellent uh, extension of these questions, debates, dilemmas, and so on. Uh, so once again, thank you all for participating and see you soon enough. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all. for the discussion and for your attention. Thank you. Bye. Likewise. Bye.